Sonia Delaunay um, was a powerhouse. She was a great cross media artist um, from painting to fashion to set and costume design, furniture, fabric design, especially fabric design. She did a lot of that. Um, and so throughout her 70 year career, um, she really maintained her integrity, whether she was doing the work for commercial purposes or not, it was always very important that it be true to her vision. And she really didn't compromise on that. She, you know, basically ran, um, well, I'll talk more about that, but she basically ran a couple of shops in her lifetime. And it didn't always work out financially well for her. But um, there were times when when her uh, work was the height of fashion. So um, let's see. Sonia Delaunay, uh, Sarah Stern. There's a number of different names that she that she was that she went by. <laughs> um, uh, 1885 to 1979 was born the youngest of three children near. Um, or in Odessa, I got a couple of different things on that, uh, in, in Ukraine, um, then part of the Russian Empire to poor Jewish parents. Her father was a foreman at a nail factory. Uh, at five, she was orphaned. Um, her father died. Her mother sent her to St. Petersburg, Russia, where she was cared for by her mother's brother. Um, Henry Turk. Henry was a successful affluent lawyer and his wife, Anna. Um, so basically she lived a privileged life with them. They, they were very well off. Um, they supported her artistic aspirations and at 18 sent her to art school in Germany where she studied until 1905 and then moved to Paris. And you see this uh, this painting on on the right, um, bright, brilliant colors. You know, this is two years after she moved to moved to Paris. Um, I'm not exactly sure when she did it, but we'll be talking more about this. She married a um, an art dealer, and. Um, so she was exposed to everything that was in the avant-garde at that point in Paris. Um, and notice the pattern background, the bright colors, the, the rounded forms and all that. This is something which will come up again and again in her work. Now, the show that's, that, that is at the Bard Center is, um, it's the Bard Graduate Center. It's a very scholarly show. It doesn't have a lot of paintings in it. It's got a few paintings, um, a lot of design work, a lot of drawings. Um, um, actually, some of her um, notebooks and things like that. It's a really, it's an interesting show, and it's it is um, a survey not a retrospective in in the sense of you know a lot of large-scale paintings but they do have some really beautiful pieces in in the show and it's 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 worth the trip just to just to see the work in person sonia entered um into a nominal marriage with wilhelm I'm not even going to even, uh, I'm not going to say that I've got that name right, Udi, um, who um, research reveals had a male lover and who um, was more a friend and mentor to, uh, to Sonia than husband. However, thanks to Udi, 
Sonia was exposed to the leading artists of the time, Picasso, Diron, um, George Brock, uh, finding herself in the heart of the um, Paris artistic life. So she was still known as Sonia Turk at that point. Um, it was thanks to Udi's gallery that Sonia met her future husband, Robert Delaunay, a year after her first exhibition in 1908. So um, they started an affair pretty much right away, and that was not a problem for her husband. Um, when she became pregnant, though, they they um, went to Uday and asked him, you know, to release her, and he did that. Um, so, on the on the left is a portrait of of Wilhelm Uday, um, and you see this kind of. Um, uh, dotted form for the for the brushwork in there and basically he had studied um the pointillists and had come up with this kind of distillation and type of brushwork that he that he had been working with um his exposure to uh the fauve and to um, cubism led him to a really different uh, take on things. The window op op windows open simultaneously first part, third motif. Um, so what you see here is basically he was on the forefront of of color theory applying this kind of cubist structure to this fauve like color. So Robert uh, Robert Robert um, worked uh, as a, a theatrical set painter, which affected his approach to large scale works. They both did mural scale pieces, both Sonia and, and Robert. Um, so you can see that, you know, the, the, um, the cubists at this point, 19, 1910, were using more earth tone colors, more monochromatic and, and, that was the innovation that Robert brought to this. Um, so this is a Matisse corner of the studio. You can see the brilliant color and then the George Brock. Um, there's also the, the business of, of the, the form playing around with the shape of the canvas and things like that. Um, and, you know, really, Delaunay was merging those, those two worlds. And this had a profound effect on, on Sonia. I mean, uh, you see this, the Finnish woman, 1908, it's a beautifully painted painting. I mean, it's brilliant color. It's very much part of the, the fauve or expressionistic tradition, but then you look at 1913 and you look at this 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 dance hall, and you get a very different very different thing. It's you know you can make out some of the figures, but it's really more about forms dancing across the surface. Um, large scale, 37 by 132 inches. Um, and at the top, you see another beautiful, this, this uh, piece is by Robert at the top. 
And again, you've got the Eiffel Tower and the, all the activity, the street, the street activity merging together. So this movement was called Orphism or Orphic Cubism, a term coined by the French poet Apollinaire in 1912 in an uh, article. Um, this was really an offshoot of, of Cubism focused on abstraction and bright colors. It was influenced by pointillism and Cubism and and Fauve. Um, Delaunay's, they're very, they're very lyrical. Now, it's a really interesting image given, given the idea that, that, um, you know, this notion of painting as a window in, into, into the world or out into the world. What is the world that he's creating here? It's one of color and form. So there's this business of they 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 have all these isms uh, simultaneism uh, endless interrelation interrelated states of being some stuff like that I don't know I don't know what exactly that means but I get that that basically there's a resonance to this that that has to do with the the action of the color and shape. The, the Americans, there were two Americans that were that were in Paris in, in 1912, um, Stanton McDonald Wright and Morgan Russell. Both were in Paris in 1912, but claim they developed their notions independently from the Delaunay's. I don't know, picking hairs. Uh, you know, this is hair splitting. Um, their abstract synchronies <laughs> were based on an approach to painting that, well, basically what, what this is, is, is synchronism was, was into that idea of, of color and form like notes of music um that it was like scales for a a composer um and these are really lovely pieces these two pieces that i picked out and put in here and you can see the similarities between what robert delaunay and sonia delaunay were doing um again this this kind of lovely tondo by Robert is it's hard for me to um, see the difference between synchronism and orphism at this point, and they would be totally offended by that. But hey, tough, <laughs> they're not here. <laughs> um, so Sonia created this this um, book cover for her son. And and this actually, um, it was it was a breakthrough. Um, both Robert and Sonia viewed this as you know for looked at the big forms, the big abstract shapes, and it kind of indicated a direction that they wanted to pursue. Um, and you can see the impact. these bigger shapes, bigger forms, um, less reliance on, on external imagery from the world, but they go back and forth. And this is, this is a um, Sonia Delaunay piece. Um, they traveled um, to um to Spain and back um the 
the reverberations of their their color and form exploration affected a number of really substantial artists across Europe and America. You know, Paul Clay, Kandinsky, Mondrian, Hans Hoffman, um, all acknowledged the lasting inspiration from their work. So they were really groundbreaking figures. Um, they opened a field of study to a kind of abstract structuralism that uh, would have a lasting, far-reaching effect. You know, it kind of gave the nod to people to explore exploration, explore abstraction in a way that they really hadn't had before. It, you know, even cubism was really still chained to, you know, looking at an object. Uh, this became about the painting and about the color. Um, and on the lower right, one of my favorites, Paul Clay. Um, and you can kind of see the, the, this is from, you know, these were all from 20, uh, 1914. So you can kind of see that there was, that there was a, a dialogue that was going on there. And again, um, the the grid, the um, abstract forms. Um, the piece on the left is a beautiful piece from uh, Tunisia. Um, actually, Paul Clay and August Mack, um, and another artist, and I, I'm forgetting his name now, took a trip to Tunisia and did this whole series of, of pieces there. Um, and um, Franz Kupka was a, a Czech painter and, and very much in, in line with, with what the Delaunays were exploring. Um, Okay, so Sonia was um, a cross-disciplinary person and by one of the things that happened was, um, well, she set up, she actually set up a, a um, uh, fashion, um, uh, dress making shop in, in Spain for a period of time. Um, the, you know, basically, um, th that didn't last for very long though. Uh, one of, one of the other things in, in the twenties, um, the, with the, Russian um, revolution taking place, her uncle, her wealthy uncle, who had been helping to support them, um, lost everything. And so Sonia really stepped into, you know, creating, creating dresses, um, doing costume and set design, um, actually, um, fabric design was was a major source of income for her and she kept the two of them going because robert's paintings weren't selling all that well um again so we're we're looking at you know the the costume design set design um for uh for the ballet um, she worked with she worked with Diaghilev too, I believe. And as with Annie Albers and Sophie Tober Arp, um, the grid 
or um, geometric pattern was a underlying motif that her work it helped unify the the um, the design. They are slightly uneven. Um, uh, it gives you a sense of 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 movement. They're they're much. They're not. They don't have a static feel. Most of the design work that she did has has this kind of vitality that that is kept even in repeat patterns. Um, that was really part of her genius along these lines. And, you know, Pope made for Gloria Swanson. Uh, <laughs> that would be something to see. Uh, okay. And, uh, you know, she just took this element and applied it wherever she could apply it. So here's a pair of shoes. Uh, you know, it, it, must have been quite something to see someone dressed in one of her dresses and and in the 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 this wonderful pair of shoes. And here here is basically um, this is this is in Paris um, uh, and. These are not actually, you know, they're they're friends of hers that just set up for this for this particular shoot. Um, that the paintings in here are um, some of the ones we've seen earlier in the presentation. Um, they're there, Robert Robert Delaunay's. and then on the on the left you see her at her table um, doing fabric design. She actually began, you know, these designs would really, you know, they must have been very unique at, at you know, in the in the 20s and 30s. Um, she began making designs, uh, design patterns for um, a large progressive store in Amsterdam called Metzen Company. Um, and they they struck up a long connection that lasted 30 or 40 years um, into the early 60s when she actually um, began to um, gain, you know, great uh, recognition for her for her paintings. Um, but these these pieces are kind of you, you know you get you get it. She's really um, a, a unique uh, designer. I love creation more than life. I must express myself before disappearing. <laughs> um, this is one of her notebooks, which is actually in the show. Um, and I wish that I could turn the pages because I wanted to see the other drawings in there. These are this is a gouache. She used she used gouache. She used opaque watercolor to design her patterns, um, and and ink, pen and ink. But um, the, she would just flow out with these ideas. And here is a, a full page. You get you get some kind of a sense. Now these would be done in different brilliant colors and and variations on 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 the theme. Um, but this gives you some idea of the diversity of the patterns that she worked with and came out with. There's not a lot of the stripes. She did a lot of stripes and a lot of squares and things like that also.
So Sonia Delaunay, designed in the style of Mondrian, possibly for a rug, 1931. Now, yes, it's got something to do with Mondrian, but Mondrian never used colors like that. Uh, this is this is a really buoyant and joyful piece. I for me anyway, um, and it's she's right in there. You see what I mean about the about the variations in in the shape. They're not perfect. They're not perfect squares. They're not taped off and and even. There's there's that handmade quality to them which makes them you know very much more alive and and interesting so um she worked up these beautiful um uh, designs this was this was for a tapestry and you know she would work them up in in gouache and then and then have them fabricated um just applying the ideas to whatever she could and this this actually this large scale tapestry is is in the show at at the Bard Center. So it's it's big. Um I don't have this I don't have the size here, but it's at least eight by twelve feet, I believe. This was designed late. This was in 1974. So um this was five years before she died. So the consistency from the beginnings into into these later works is something that's that's fascinating. Okay. And here are two really large scale mural scale pieces. They're they're hmm, I'm I'm gonna say that they're um at least eight by eight feet, if not 10, 10 by 10. Um, they were set up for a uh, a salon showing. Um, and the one on the on the right is Ro Robert. The one on the left is Sonia. This is 1938. Now, they didn't know this at the time, but you know, things were getting hot in Europe. Um, and being of of um, Jewish heritage, although she did not practice Judaism, um, given the atmosphere with the uh, Nazis at the time, um, they actually headed headed south. They headed out of Paris to um, the south of France when the Nazis came in. And um, they were in the free, quote unquote, free French zone. Um, I don't know how free it was, but Ro Robert died. He became sick. He he was never of great health. He had an enlarged heart and some other things going on with him. Um, and he got sick when they when they moved to the south of France and died in i believe it was 1941 i i'll double check my my dates but i think that's when it was um so sonia moved in for a time with hans arp and um sophie tober arp um and let's see oh and here they are this is a photograph of on the on the far left is Sophie Tober R. Um, and then it, in the in the chair with the sunglasses on, I believe that is yeah that's that's uh, Sonia, and uh, Hans R. 
is is uh, standing behind them, and this is another friend on on the on the right. Um, interesting, you know, she she stayed with them after after his passing, and I believe uh, I'll check my numbers, but but. Um, there are a lot of similarities between Sophie Tober Arp and Sonia Delaunay. Um, Sophie, and I did do a talk on her. There was a big show last year um, at the Museum of Modern Art. Um, was it last year? Yeah. Anyway, um, and the the work that Sophie did is very similar in certain ways to Sonia Delaunay. Um, much more geometric, harder edged, but but the the crossover between between fashion and and fine art become very blurred. Um, they were all involved in the Dadaist movement, which was kind of breaking down barriers between disciplines anyway. Um, so this is a really interesting period of time. Um, and Sophie died. Um, and I can't for the life of me remember now what it was, but it was something absurd. She died of an infection or something like that. Um, uh, but this is this is Sophie's work, actually. The, um, the uh, vertical and horizontal composition from 1916. You can see the kind of you know. There's a bit of a correlation. She did a lot of a lot of rugs, a lot of a lot of um, mural projects, um, and then this crazy costume for a, a housewarming party. Uh, <laughs> So, as I said, Sophie did a lot of things, and this armchair was in was created in 1923 for their for their apartment. Um, and then this piece is a scale model of what was actually produced in 1967 as a car that Sophie designed. So she continued to work. She began to really um, focus in um, on painting more. Um, she really spent the the ten years after Robert's passing uh, promoting his career more than her own. Um, she paint. She was painting, and she was doing the the um, the fabric design and all that for Metz and company. Um, they were really great supporters. In fact, there was a bit of a love affair between her and the and the um, the man who ran Metz and company. Actually, there's a wonderful talk on YouTube with. Um, his son, who knew Sophie from when he was a very young child, he met her first when he was about four years old, he claims. This is worth watching because he has great stories. Um, but she she was involved in in on various levels with Metz and Company. She continued to paint in the 40s and 50s. She did her own work. By the 50s, she began to really um, uh, focus more on her own work and getting it out there. And um, She began to have shows. She had a big show in, I believe it was 1964, in one of the big museums in, in Paris. 
And that was a retrospective. And there was another retrospective in Germany. Um, this is a show from 1980. So she had just passed in 1979 when, when this show was mounted at the Albright Knox. I don't know where it traveled to, but I am wish I'd gotten to see it. Uh, <laughs> And you can get more of a sense of the scale of, of, of her work in seeing these, these people in relationship to it in the gallery. Um, there is a consistent exuberance in this work. Um, it's inherent. There's a vitality, there's a, a, a buoyance and joy in 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 this work um straight from the start a great spirit um so and there she is 1964 and uh this was this was getting toward the end of her doing fabric design so you know these these were these were just um, you know this is her focus was more and more on painting. Um, and so the show is at the Bard Graduate Center until July seventh. Um, and that is 18 West 86th Street, so it's it's not too hard to get to. Um, we went in on uh, the weekend, and um, it was really pretty easy to find parking and all that. Um, the interesting part is the show that's going on at the Metropolitan with... Um, Annie Albers and the, the the fiber show that's going on over there. Um, it, it is definitely worth taking in both of those shows. And that there's there's it really raises the bar on what you expect from design. Um, there's there's a lot of soul and mystery in these pieces. Um, so there, there's going to be two Paul Clay shows that are happening in New York City in, in the spring, into the summer. Uh, and so my next talk is going to be on Paul Clay, picking up on what the Dillonais gave to him and <laughs> moving it forward. Um, really one of my favorite artists. Paul Clay is just a, uh, just a wonderful artist. So uh, that will be on the 19th. So I hope to see you there. Um, if there are any questions, I'll look in the chat, but I'm not seeing anything there. <laughs> well, thank you. Okay, so I'll see you the next time. <laughs>